Hello everyone, welcome to All Team Academy. I'm your host, Zach Peterson, and today we're gonna to be answering a viewer question about the filter stage that you can put on an ADC. Now, if you've been watching our recent series on analog to digital converters, you've probably been seeing a lot of different design strategies with these components, and we got a great question about designing the filter section. We're gonna look at that question today, how these filters are set up, both for high impedance and low impedance sources, and of course, we're gonna do an example calculation for a 12-bit ADC. Come follow along and check it out. So before we get into this, let's take a look at that viewer question. Superfan Fetty Mockney writes, could you add the analog input filter calculation for the next video if possible? I would like to know, for example, the frequencies that the low pass filter will remove and how that can affect the measurements. Thank you for your time. So this is a great question, and it relates to the use of filters on the input analog interface on an ADC. If you have, let's say, an ADC right here, and you take a look at the interface here, let's say this is A in number one, sometimes what you will see is an RC filter on this interface. So we have a capacitor going to ground, and then we have a resistor here, and then here we have our source. So here, this RC circuit effectively is a low pass filter. Because this is a low pass filter, selecting the R and the C values is going to determine a couple of things. So first, in the frequency domain, it's going to determine the roll off in the filter's transfer function. So I'm just gonna sketch the transfer function here for this type of filter. But essentially the transfer function looks something like this. And there's a 3 dB filter crossover point right about here. And this is related to the RC product or the time constant of this filter. And so this F 3 dB term is proportional to one over 2 pi r times c. So this is sometimes also called the cutoff frequency. It does produce this roll off in the frequency domain, and so of course you can use it to limit the bandwidth of this input interface. So if I have some, let's say, arbitrary, let's say, signal coming out of my source that I want to sample, what this filter will do is it will cut off any higher frequency components above some value. So it will modify the shape of this signal. So depending on what this R and C value are, it will determine the cutoff frequency. But if the cutoff frequency is too low, well then it will limit what can be accurately sampled by this ADC because it is removing some of the true frequency content that's in this signal. Now the other perspective at which we can look at this filter is of course in the time domain. So in the time domain, if I were to look at, say, the voltage that is being given into this analog input with respect to ground, if we have a rising edge across this signal, essentially it's going to charge up this capacitor, and the voltage over time is going to look something like this. And so again, the RC time constant, we'll just call it tau, is going to determine the rate of rise in this signal. And of course, if we then have the opposite case where this is discharging, it will then fall exponentially. So in either case, the RC time constant is going to determine how the input voltage looks over time based on the values of these two components. So the next question that we have to answer here is, how does this rate of change in the signal affect the readout coming into this analog input. Because remember, effectively what this ADC has to do is it has to convert this analog signal into a set of discrete values, which we can index kind of like this with these tick marks. And so it has to detect the voltage change between these two values seen at the analog input within some time limit. And so hopefully you can already see where I'm going with this. The input has to respond fast enough to this rising signal meaning this rising signal has to settle at some value that is close to the true value that you're trying to measure in order for this converted signal to be read out correctly or accurately by this ADC. So that means we can't make the RC time constant too large because if we make it too large, we're going to inhibit the ability for this input to settle at the correct value within the required time interval. 
You can use the sampling rate and the time interval and your bandwidth target to figure out how big the R and the C values need to be in this filter circuit. So now let's take a look at an example that actually uses the sampling interval in order to determine what these values of R and C need to be. So there are a couple of relations that we need to use. So the first relationship that we need to use is the sampling rate. And the sampling rate needs to be chosen such that it satisfies the Nyquist-Shannon theorem limitation. And essentially that this says that the sampling rate for a single channel needs to be double whatever the bandwidth is for this channel. So remember, if I take a look at this input signal, Vn, in the frequency domain, it's going to have some frequency content. And this uh, ADC is only going to be able to sample up to some limit that we call B, the bandwidth. And this bandwidth is going to be essentially half the maximum sampling rate. So we want to set the sampling rate such that it is greater than double the bandwidth that we want to measure, or the bandwidth contained in that signal. So not all signals have infinite bandwidth. Some signals can be modeled as having near finite bandwidth. You can use that to figure out the minimum sampling rate. Now, that sampling rate is, of course, going to determine a sampling interval. So we have some acquisition time. We'll call it TACQ. That's related to the sampling rate. So we need to set our RC value such that it's less than this acquisition time. But it's actually multiplied by this term inside of a logarithm. And it's related to the input capacitance seen on this pin. So we're going to call this CN. And this is multiplied by 2 to the n plus 1 power, where n is the number of bits. And then we're dividing this by CN plus C of our capacitor here. Now this C right here is actually the total capacitance. So it's R times CN plus C. So this is an equation that we can use to then size what R and C need to be in order to ensure that we're below this acquisition time that's required in order to take digital samples of this signal. As long as we know the number of bits, and then as long as we know the input capacitance, we can figure all of this out. Now, an important point to remember here is that this input capacitance could be much smaller than this value for C. So this value for C can be quite large, especially if you're trying to cut off at a very low frequency. Same thing for R. This R could be reasonably large, maybe in the 50 or 100 ohm range. Typically, when I do it, I use a much smaller value for R, and then I choose a bigger value for C. And I'll show you why here in just a moment. Depending on these two values, as long as you know C sub n, you can then possibly approximate this as essentially just being C and just being C here. So be careful with that. Make sure you understand the input capacitance value on this analog interface, and then you'll be able to do this calculation. So just as an example, let's say that we have a 22 ohm resistor. And let's just say, for example, this is one nanofarad. And we'll go with, say, a 10 picofarad input capacitance. If we then plug in the numbers to that other formula, we'd have 22 times 1.01 times 10 to the negative ninth. And then we're going to be using a 12-bit ADC. So this will be 0.01 times 2 to the 13th power divided by 1.01. The minimum acquisition time can be found just by cranking through this. And we get 97 nanoseconds. So as long as our sampling time or our acquisition time is longer than 97 nanoseconds, we can use these two values for our input. Now, what is the cutoff going to be? So the cutoff frequency is going to be 1 divided by 2 pi times 22 times 1 times 10 to the negative ninth. So that's going to be our cutoff frequency. So I'll let you guys plug in the values here to see what the cutoff frequency is. But as you can already tell, it's a reasonably high frequency in the megahertz range. This is how you then pair up the values here for your R and C values, as well as your bandwidth to then determine what the minimum sampling rate is going to be. Because remember, the sampling rate, F sub S, is going to have to be bigger than some bandwidth limit. So effectively, this right here is your bandwidth limit. So your sampling rate is going to have to be greater than double whatever this F sub B value is. So just plug in the numbers, and this is what you're going to get. 
That's everything you need to do to design this filter. Now in this example, we haven't made any assumption on the impedance of the source, other than it is a low impedance source. Now, what do we do if we have a high impedance source? If we have a high impedance source, typically what we would do is we would actually put this through like a voltage follower, or we would put it through some other buffer circuit so that we can then convert that high impedance source to a low impedance output. What we can actually do in this case is we can use that buffer as a filter circuit. So it is possible to do filter circuits with op amps. We'll call that an active filter circuit. So here's what our circuit is gonna look like. We're gonna have a source, and then that source is going to connect to our op amp into the non-inverting input. Then our inverting input is gonna be part of our feedback loop. So we're gonna take our feedback loop, and our feedback loop is gonna contain the resistor and capacitor that we need for filtering. So I have my R and my C values here. Then off of the uh, inverting input, we're gonna have another resistor, and then here we connect this to ground. So this is our active filter that we can use to convert, say, a high Z source into a lower impedance output looking towards our ADC. So this is gonna be our analog input over in that direction. So in this case, we have an R1 here, and then we have an R2 here. We've got two resistors. So the time constant of this filter is just given by R1 multiplied by C. So it's these two components that set the cutoff for this filter, and they also set the rise time for the output from the filter. So from here, we can effectively proceed the same way that we did before. We have our filter characteristics defined by two components, and then we can use that to match the rise time of this output signal that then reaches the analog input to the acquisition time in our analog to digital converter. As long as that acquisition time is long enough, we're then gonna be able to read the output from this buffer circuit properly. And of course, this buffer circuit converts the impedance just as we need to so that we can sample it at the ADC. Thanks for watching everybody. And in this video, I only looked at low pass filters or RC filters to use for filtering ADC inputs. Now, if you look up the use of RC filters as an input filter on an ADC, it's typically called anti-aliasing. And this is sometimes called an anti-aliasing filter. So keep that in mind if you're doing any searching online. RC filters aren't the only filter that you could use. You could actually use a bandpass filter. It's a little bit more complex and it's probably something I will tackle in a future video. For now, thanks for watching everybody. Make sure to leave those comments and questions in the comment section. Of course, hit that subscribe button. And last but not least, don't forget to call your fabricator, folks.